this takes a wee while to load before it actually tells me that I'm on live. There we go. Now today is Rate Castle and I hope you've brought snacks because uh, today I decided to avoid the garden and I have six pages of information for you on Rate Castle. <laughs> I'll just get straight into it. As per usual, this is an amalgamation of what I could find online because, of course, the libraries are all shut at the moment. So some bits do repeat themselves in other language because I was editing right up until 10 minutes ago. So some bits will repeat themselves more so at the end than at the beginning of it. So, Rate Castle is a ruined Hall House castle, technically not a castle, dating from the 13th century, situated two miles south of the highland town of Nairn, near Inverness. It's a scheduled ancient monument and a Category A listed building. The building is clearly visible to travellers on the A939 if they know where to look, apparently. Oh, I haven't got this open on the other page so I can see any comments. Whoopsie. That's because I was editing until like 10 minutes ago. <laughs> right. Let's have a look. See. And we'll turn off the bleeps and beeps of Facebook. And then I can actually see if anybody comments on either of the two pages. Architecture. Technically, Rate is not a castle, but a hall house, a building that must have been much more common across the country than is generally supposed. Basically, it's a tower house that's only there for the purpose of having a main hall. That's it. Rate is one of only a handful of such castles still standing in Scotland and the only one which is still complete to the wall head and has no later additions. Additions. No longer visible beneath the vegetation are a courtyard with walls of nine foot high and the remains of the chapel of St Mary of Rate. The building was a two-storey building measuring 20 metres by 10 metres. It had an unvaulted basement and an upper hall. The basement, unheated and indifferently lit, in other words, not very well lit, was probably used for storage, reached by a wooden stair from the floor above, with defensive arrow slits secured by iron grills supplying ventilation. The hall was entered from the outside through an impressive doorway in the south wall, reached by an outside wooden stair and was protected by a portcullis with a wooden door inside it secured with a drawbar. You know when they have the big bar across the doorways? That's a drawbar. The small lancet window by the door was for the porter, as in halt who goes there, or here boss or somebody coming will open the door or nay. <clears throat> where are we, where are we, where are we? There would have also been a screen closing off this end of the hall itself and forming a lobby. The screen might have had a minstrel's gallery above it. The hall had a wooden floor supported by a scarcement ledge, which, as you can imagine, means a very small ledge that is hardly there, which is probably why there's no floor now. At the far end of the hall from the screen would have been a raised dais, dais or dais, for the high table. It's a raised section, a floor in, basically. It looks like a wee stage. At the far... Um, for the high table. This was lit by two windows, one either side. Sometimes the high table is called the high birdie. 
I haven't tracked down where that where that comes from or what it literally translates as because I've already got six pages of information. <laughs> The high birthday was where the Lord and his family took their meals, bathed in sunlight streaming in through the large windows at this end of the hall, and heated by the handsome hooded fireplace, which is flanked by brackets for lamps. The hall is lit by large pointed windows with benches either side, and part of the simple window tracery survives. The windows both had the windows had both iron grills and wooden shutters which have both left traces in the stonework and the roofs of their embrasures in other words the sticky bit that the windows housed in has a ribbed vault the walls of the castle are nearly six foot thick a projecting round tower entered from the high birdie end housed the lord's the lord's private apartment the tower room has two arrow slits and one large window with bench seats, together with a fine domed roof built in concentric courses of stone. So as you look up, it's a domed ceiling and it's almost like a snail shell. So it just goes round and round and round until it gets to the centre. The joist holes for the supporting floor have disappeared during modern repairs and a narrow rectangular projection on the other side of the building, on the west side, that projects nearly 13 feet out, was the latrine. Projecting so far out, you're making sure that the water in Everhin stays well away from the walls of the castle, so it's actually protecting the stonework by having your latrine so far out. There seems also to have been an attic in the roof space from which access was gained to a defensive wall walk. In other words, a path at the top of the wall for the house guard to patrol. The kitchen and other service rooms were probably housed in timber buildings outside in the barmkin or courtyard. The remnant of one structure is visible attached to the gable beside the doorway. All were enclosed within a perimeter wall. So you have the tower, you have the wooden buildings that went with it all of it surrounded by a curtain wall. The hall stood on the north side of a courtyard with other buildings round it, the remains of which some, some still stand. One has to have been the kitchen. Another may perhaps have been the chapel of St Mary recorded in the late 12th century. There were magnificent views from the site before the trees grew up, remember? though it is in a poor defensive position. Its courtyard is bounded on one side by higher ground. And then I took a, a direct list, direct lift off of one of my works websites. The following is an extract from the Canmore database, which is administered by the Royal Commission of the Ancient and Historic Monuments of Scotland, or ARCAMS as we call it. Rate Castle, a rare example of a small stone hall house of the early 14th century, was examined by Stuart Cruden and Professor Simpson in 1957. It occupies a bad defensive position overlooked from the south by a rough irregular knoll on your Ordnance Survey maps as Ord Hill. There are slight traces on the north side of the castle suggesting a, an enclosing ditch. So you've got a perimeter wall and a ditch. So similar kind of construction to um, Duffus Castle, except the walls at the bottom of the hill, if it was like Duffus Castle. The hall measured approximately 54 foot by 22 foot and up to 36 feet in height with walls nearly six foot thick. A round tower projects from one corner and there is a garderobe, which is the fancy old fashioned word for toilet, a garderobe tower, which projects nearly 13 feet in the west side and is eight foot wide. So it's a sizable bathroom, eight foot wide bathroom. The portion of a wall embedded in the east gable is older than the hall house and is probably a remnant of an older manor house. 
The long tenement on the west side is older too, as it appears to have been shortened to make room for the hall house. Between the hall, the hall and the knoll to the south, the hill to the south, is the, is the courtyard. The south wall of which incorporates a steep, smooth granite outcrop of about 8 foot high and 80 foot long. It, the tower is constructed of similar materials. No, it, the wall is constructed of similar materials to the hall house and stands to a height of 9 foot and is 2.5 foot thick. The detached building, 32 foot by 16 foot, southeast of the Hall House, is possibly the Chapel of St Mary of Rate, or the Hermit's Chapel, as some locals call it. In 1343, Nicholas the Hermit was in occupation in the chapel, and records exist of the chapel from 1189 to 1199. So it's actually older than Elgin Cathedral. The whole lot was surrounded by a curtain wall, whilst a defensive ditch may also have surrounded the site. A small, now abandoned settlement to the east of the castle is believed to be associated with the fortification. So when they went from a house to a house with a dirty great big curtain wall and a ditch and all the defensive stuff, you needed a lot of workers, so there was an extra little village sprung up beside it. <coughs> the last recorded reference to a castle on this site was in 1596, accepting the mention of Castleton of Rate in 1622. But despite its antiquity and uniqueness, Rate's walls are overgrown with undergrowth, and young trees sprout from the wall heads, their roots boring into the 800-year-old mortar that still holds the stones in place. In recognition of its historical importance, Rate Castle is both a scheduled ancient monument and a Category A listed building. Yet, and despite a new act going through the Scottish Parliament, it's not new now, it was March 2010, there is no burden on anyone to ensure that a scheduled monument does not fall down. The owner is obliged to do nothing that might damage the structure, but doesn't actually have to do anything to make sure it stays standing. I'm nearly finished with the architecture and then we can move on to history, which is a bit more interesting. <laughs> Field visit done in between 2005 and 2008. A special survey of Rate Castle was carried out between 2005 and 2008 to improve the record of the site following clearance of the undergrowth by the estate. This included a measured and photographic survey of the upstanding first floor hall. A review of the features that became visible as a result of the clearance in July 2008 indicated that there were additional ranges of buildings in the southeast of the hall and a ditch on the northwest and possibly northeast of the hall. A visual survey of the wall top was carried out from a cherry picker provided by the estate. A wall walk was visible along the southeast wall top and a floor on top of the vaulted ceiling over the round tower suggesting a room that was only accessible from the wall walk. Regeneration of the undergrowth precluded further survey. So the bushes were growing back as fast as they were clearing them. Now we're on the history, which can be a bit confusing, but it's not quite so uh, dry and stale. The following account has been put together primarily from the History of Nairnshire by George Bain and um, Castles and Fortified Houses by um, Richard, who wrote the guidebook for Elgin Cathedral and I can't remember his last name right at the moment. The Macintoshes. Ah, uh, yeah. 
a big bull staring at you would put anybody off, Scott. I. The Manor of Wright was originally held by the Macintosh family, who probably built the first substantial residence there. The first written record of the family's ownership is from a charter dated 1165, when it was granted by William I, William the Lion, to Shaw Macintosh. He was the son of Duncan Macduff, Earl of Fife, and later served the crown as constable of Inverness Castle. Alongside Raid, Duncan also held the manors of Rothy Marcus and Michael Geddes. He is said to have married Helen, the daughter of the second recorded Thane of Cawdor. These lands passed to his son, Thercard, F-E-R-Q-U-H-A-R-D. Macintosh in 1210. Their chiefs holding their chiefs holding the Lordship of Petty in the west near Inverness. When Fairquard succeeded him, Fairquard died in 1274, so he was only in charge for 64 years. But when he died, he left an only child, Angus, who was underage. So he was an active old man because he left an underage son. During whose minority, the Cummings took possession of Rate and other Macintosh lands. As Norman Knights, they dropped their surname and appear in the records of the period as De Wraith, De Rate, as in R A I T, or De Rate, R A T E. Wars of Independence and the Derates. This was the time of the untimely death of Margaret, the Maid of Norway. It is only speculation, but it seems likely that these comings were related to the John Common, Lord of Badnoch. There's a few nasty folk come out of that place, eh? One of several claimants to the Scottish throne and perhaps with a view to enhancing their kinsman's claim. The de Rates became fervent supporters of Edward I of England, Longshanks, who appointed himself as overlord of the realm of Scotland. Now, some of you are sitting there going, who's John Common? If you've seen the Braveheart movie, which remember is 80% fiction, John Commons, the dude where Wallace takes his horse into his house and drops him, drops a mace on a chain and <coughs> on his face while he's asleep. <coughs> That's the John Common they're on about. It was Gervais de Rate who constructed the fortified hall house that is visible today in the early 14th century as a replacement for the existing manor house. The new structure was constructed directly over the existing building and portions of the old were incorporated into the new structure. Gervais de Rate was appointed Knight Constable of the Royal Castle at Nairn and in 1292, when Edward summoned a Scottish Parliament at Berwick Castle, both Gervais and his son Andrew attended and swore fealty to Longshanks. So in 1292, the owners of Rate Castle went and swore loyalty to Longshanks. Appearing on what was what has become known derisorily as the Ragman Roll, so both Gervais and Andrew are on the Ragman Roll, 1292, they also opposed William Wallace's uprising in 1296-7 and the rebellion of Robert the Bruce in 1306. Despite this opposition to the new Scottish regime and attempts by the Macintosh family to reassert their claim on the building, the castle remained in the hands of the Cummings. Following William Wallace's call to arms, this is where it got disjointed because I ran out of time. Following William Wallace's call to arms in 1296, Henry Shen, 
Bishop of Aberdeen and others attempted to put down the insurrection, but without avail. Sir Andrew de Rate appears to have taken an active part along with them and was sent south as the bearer of dispatches to Edward to give an account of the services rendered by his friends in the north. Edward himself came to Nairn at the head of his army in 1303. Can you imagine that? Nairn being such a wee place in 1303 and all of a sudden the King of England appears at the front of his army. That would be quite intimidating. He spent a fortnight based at Lochindorb Castle. As I've always said, nothing good ever came out of Lochindorb Castle. Hunting in the woods, which then, which then surrounded the loch, and sending out raiding parties to, to subjugate the castles that were then held against him. Inverness, Cromarty, Achert, and Nairn. It would be strange if the king did not at some stage visit his loyal subject Gervais at Rate Castle, which then, as now, was on the main road from Loch Endorb to Nairn. Sir Alexander Rate killed the third Thane of Cawdor, chief of the clan Calder, in 1395, and then fled south where he married the heiress of Hall Green, which leads to a whole other story about a whole other castle. Rate Castle later passed from the de Rates back to the Macintosh family and eventually to the Campbell family. But we're going to go back to this Macintoshes again. The de Rates had opposed Robert the Bruce, but the Macintoshes had rendered him royal loyal service at Bannockburn. And when Robert I became king in 1306, the Macintoshes revived their claim to the lands at Rate. Surprisingly, however, they were granted their lands back, but the Cummings were allowed to stay. So the feud between the two families continued. So Robert I has said, aye, sure, here, have your land back, but the Cummings want to move out. So yeah, big feuds, more feuds. Clan memories were long then, and the trouble between the two clans bubbled to the surface again in 1424 when the Cummings hanged some of the Macintosh men. Retaliation after retaliation followed until the Cummings hatched a cunning plan. In 1442, Alexander Lord Gordon granted a charter of the lands of Rate and Michael Geddes to the Macintosh chief. And it seems to have been in that same year the castle was abandoned forever. In 1442, same year, when the, when the castle passed back to the Macintoshes from the Durates, a feast was held at the castle between the two families. Yeah, this is definitely going to repeat itself. A feast was to be held at the castle between the two families. They invited the Macintoshes to rate on the pretense of a meeting to settle their differences, but actually planned to slaughter them as soon as they had surrendered their weapons. However, the Macintoshes were allegedly alerted to the danger by a daughter of the Cummings family. There seems to be confusion, some confusion about the sing it at the height of the feast when a bull's head was ushered into the hall might be the same bull Scott you never know <laughs> aye there, there probably is yeah when the bull's head was ushered into the hall and the other source says it was at the standing for the toast whichever it was the excitement was at its height fueled by drink and anticipation on both sides. Suitably prepared, the Macintoshes repulsed the ambush and instead it was the Cummings who were cut down. Second last page, woohoo! <coughs> 
The clan chief fled to an upstairs room to avoid the slaughter. And while he got, when he got to that room, he encountered the woman who he believed betrayed him. She tried to escape through a window. And because he cut off her hands, she fell to her death. The castle is said to be haunted by her ghost with no hands. Rate Castle remained occupied throughout the 16th century, so one source says, but the rest of them say it was abandoned that year and was referenced in documents dated 1596 and 1622, the latter naming Castledon of Rate, as in Castle Down of Rate, but was probably abandoned shortly thereafter. An unsubstantiated local rumour suggests that Prince William, Duke of Cumberland, stayed here in 1746 on his way north to defeat the Jacobites at Culloden. But this seems improbable given better lodgings would have been available in nearby Nairn. And random fact of the day, American singer Bonnie Raitt is a descendant of the Raitt clan and she visited the castle in 1990. Now, the ghost story. The only ghost story that I could find connected. The story of the Rate Castle ghost, again lifted from George Bain's History of Nairnshire. The story is to the effect that coming of Rate, under the guise of a desire to bury former animosities and establish friendly relations, invited the Macintosh and his followers to a grand banquet at Rate. The invitation was accepted and the Macintoshes, never doubting, pre prepared to attend. They were, however, timely warned that the Cummings had planned a foul plot and that at a given signal, each Cumming would rise and slay his defenceless guest. Old Cumming had put all of his household under a solemn oath that they would not reveal the plot to any person. But his daughter, anxious for the safety of a, a young Macintosh, who was her lover, found a way to disclose the plot. Hi, Janet. She went to a large boulder some distance from the castle and told the whole story to the stone. That way, she's not actually breaking her father's promise because she's not telling anyone, she's telling a stone. But she knew all along that her lover was hiding behind it because this was where they usually met because it was technically off of the property and safe. The stone to this day apparently is called the Stone of the Maiden and I didn't have time to look up where it is but the first thing that comes to mind is a Pictish stone called Maiden Stone but I don't know if it's the same one or not. So she told the stone the entire story of what she'd overheard her father saying. The stone is called the Stone of the Maiden. The Macintoshes notwithstanding the warning, resolved to attend the feast. When the night of the banquet came, each Macintosh hid his dirk in his plaid, but gaily took his seat at the festive board of coming of rate. The revelry ran high and the walls of the castle rang to the mirthful shouts of the carousers. At length, the toast was given. The memory of the dead. This was the signal agreed upon for the slaughter of the guests. The Cummings rose and were about to draw their swords, but the Macintoshes, being forewarned, were forearmed and with a yell of derision sprang to their feet, drew their daggers and thrust them into the hearts of the Cummings. Among the few who escaped death, was the old chief of the Cummings. He rushed to an upper room, an upper chamber, 
to get away from the bloodshed. And when he got there, his daughter was there. He chased her around the room. He believed she had given the information to the Macintoshes. She begged her father to be kind. She begged her father to forgive her. Trying to put a bit of space between her and him. She decided the only way out was through the window, even though she was two stories up. So she climbed out the window. Her father, knowing full well that she had a relationship with a young Macintosh man, had no doubt that she had told them what was going to happen. So it was her fault that half of his clan had been slaughtered at the dinner table. She got out the window. She was just preparing to lower herself down in a bid to save her life. And as she's hanging from the windowsill by her fingertips, her father chopped both hands off with his broadsword and she fell to her death. The way it's worded here, he rushed to an upper chamber where his daughter was, whom he believed to have given the information as he knew the girl and the young Macintosh were lovers. Seeing the maddened state of her father, the young lady sought to escape from him by leaping out of the window. But before she could do so, he cut off both her hands with a broadsword. She fell to her death. From that, from that, from the night on which this tragedy was enacted, the blood-stained walls of rate have been tenantless. So, according to the story, that was the last time living people were in that house. Even though the historical record begs to differ, and has references from fifteen ninety six and sixteen twenty two. She was killed in 1442. Half her clan was killed too, but the very fact that she was killed by her own father. Not nice. Now, I then find a little bit that puts things into perspective. There's a wee note on one of the websites. Remember, when Rate Castle was abandoned in 1442, James the second was the King of Scots. Henry the sixth was the King of England. The Wars of the Roses were in the future. Leonardo da Vinci and Michelangelo have not yet been born. And Rosslyn Chapel was a mere gleam in Sir William St. Clair's eye. So all this happened long before a load of this other stuff did. That's not too bad. Six pages, nine, uh, 35 minutes. Mm-hmm. Did I take it you didn't find it then, Kate? Ah, yeah, our clock bell tower, yeah. Yep. Maybe you felt what she was feeling. Or maybe you felt what some of the clansmen did when they sat down for dinner that, that night. But it's weird when you, you know, because a lot of folk are like, oh, Leonardo da Vinci, Michelangelo. A lot of folk think of that as like, way, way, way before everything. But all of this happened before either of them were born. That's that's the bits I like is when you find something that puts it into um puts it into scope for you, you know. It's like wow wow <laughs> Here was me thinking, right, let me have a look. 
for this Stone of the Maiden. Stone of the main Maiden. I have found a something. Dun, dun, dun. It's like a charity rock. It's like a bunch of smaller stones all blend together. Um, I don't know if it will do it, but let me try and copy the image. If I can copy the image, it might let me paste it in here. Let's have a look, see. I did not think it was the same one. I thought it was just my head playing. Well, see, that's the other one I thought of as well. What's written on this blog from 2009? It's been a lovely bright autumn weekend. I took a walk to a local landmark called the Stone of the Maiden. Lying in the dappled sunlight of a large wood, this extraordinary rock, a mass of small stones bound together many millions of years ago, played a key role in Nairnshire's 16th century, well, it's actually 15th century, version of Romeo and Juliet. This was the stone where the lovers would meet prior to the tragic denouement ultimately played out at Rate Castle. Um, oh, this person doubts the story. They have a few questions after. They've recounted the same story I've just told you. And then he's turned around and said, he says, three questions remain in my mind. How do you cut off both of a young girl's hands when she's hanging out the window? Why did the Macintoshes leave the castle to become ruinous and not take it over when it was then available to them? Why do the custodians of Scotland's architectural heritage continue to allow this, the best standing example of a 13th century hall house, to be overtaken by the surrounding undergrowth? I can't comment on that last one. <laughs> but he doesn't actually say where it is. Um... Sueno stone. No. That's the only one that even mentions it. But there is a picture of stone. I don't think it's let me upload the picture there. No, it hasn't, but I will post it on at the end of this. It would just be Murphy's Law if it turned out to be the Flaming Jesus Stone, wouldn't it? <laughs> so there's only that one thing that says where it is, but he's put a photo of it up. So I will tweak the photo and copy it across into the comments here at the end. But it's the only one... I wonder if that's got in there, no, no. Because all the other ones say is outside of the castle walls. No, that's one of the ones I looked at. It doesn't tell you actually where it is. Doesn't tell you where it is. Lone head maiden stone, yeah, yeah. Wrong maiden stone. This is the stone of the maiden, not maiden stone. <laughs> I can't find a thing that tells me where it is. It's a long, long flat one. Um, if I can 
bring up the picture. Right. I don't know how good this is going to be on framing and that, but let's have a look. See? So we'll frame you here. All right. I'll flick over that stone. As you can see, it's got little other little stones in it. So it's, it's a concretion. It's a, a mixture of volcanic rock and rubble. And it's quite flat and rectangular. I don't know how much of that you could actually see, but I'll flick back until I see it coming up on the phone so I can see what you can see. Yeah. So, yeah, it's a, it's a big flat rock. Looking at the picture, it looks like it's almost the size of a bed, which would make sense if it was where the lovers met. So, yeah. I do think it is slightly to the south. I'm sure one of the things said it was just to the south of the building. I'm sure one of the bits I read said the stone was to the south of the building. So it might actually be that way. But it's a big flat one, and I will cop. I will copy the image into the comments here because it's not letting me put it in while I'm online. But yeah, as for how do you cut off both her hands when she's hanging out the windowsill, if she's holding on to the inside and looking to see how she can lower herself down. All you've got to do is take a sword right across the windowsill. Imagine doing that to your own daughter. Bad, bad, bad. I mean, I okay, he lost family members, but holy toot. Mutilating and killing your ain bearing. It shows you the difference in values between then and now. Seeing as they've added longer time into lockdown, I'm adding more slots. I'm adding Joseph Merrick. I'm adding the, the Pictish Fort at Burghead. And potentially a few other bits and pieces onto the programs. And we will see how far we go before we're all allowed out to play again. Oh, you'd have to be. You'd have to be in sheer temper. Because he ran, he ran up the stairs to get away from the bloodshed so he wouldn't be killed. And then when he gets to the room that he thinks is safe, he finds his daughter. And as far as he's concerned, this is all his daughter's fault. And he's chased her around the room. And if she's suspending herself out the window, he cuts off her feckin' hand so she falls. And she's dead. It's mental. It's a shame the, um, what is it, the SSPCC didn't exist then. They should have rehomed re her. <laughs> but a lot of daughters of a lot of big houses have ended up in similar situations. A green lady at Castle Grant. There's a fair few that have been locked in and starved to death and left to die in their rooms. Yeah, it didn't pay to be a, a queen back then. So that's Rate Castle. 
And even so, six bits of paper only killed, only killed 35 minutes. <sighs> this is getting to be hard work, man. <laughs> Let me look up the thing. Thank you to those who have already donated. It really is helping. Because like a, like a lot of you, it's uh, not a lot coming in at the moment. So thank you to those who have donated. If you are enjoying the lockdown videos and you want to contribute 10p 50p a quid it really doesn't matter every every little helps to use a an overly used phrase <coughs> but i don't want you putting money in if you're skint if you have a little extra and feeling generous, yeah, by all means, add to the pot if you want. This is the tip jar. can't type and talk at the same time because <laughs> I end up typing what I'm saying. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think that sickly feeling is either what she was feeling or what her spirit feels if she really is still stuck there and wandering around. Yeah, she she's going to be completely heartbroken. Completely heartbroken. Because she only suspended herself out of the window in a bid to save herself. After telling her lover the story of what was going to happen in a bid to save him. And as it turns out, he survived. And she got killed on the same day. You know, so... She's going to be heartsick if it is her. It could equally be one of the ones that went to dinner. Whether it's a Macintosh or a Cumming. Could be anybody, really. Because you had a big, the big, the main bulk of both clans, or both local branches of the clans there. So, it could be anybody. But the ground floor is going to be the storage rooms. It's going to be the cellar, all the action, the fighting was up the stair on the floor that's now got a floor. Oh, oh cool, cool Scott. So if you can see the water it must be pretty clear to the main road then. But yeah, all this counts as me expanding my local knowledge, so I really don't mind. Joseph Meg has been added to the list after the posts that I shared from Richard Jones's page, where he'd taken a wander across to Joseph's grave. If you don't know who Joseph Merrick is, he's the elephant man. That's how history remembers him. He's the elephant man. <coughs> <coughs> yeah, exactly, Kate. Yeah. I think he, he might actually feel worse than her because she did what she did to save his life and it ended up with her getting killed. So he probably felt guilty as well. Mm hmm yeah see this this kind of goes into right we're gonna we're gonna put one step into the paranormal side here well both feet into the paranormal side right stone tape theory 
CDs, cassette tapes, videos all contain silica, iron and quartz. Sandstone also contains silica, iron and quartz. Sometimes when you see someone walking down a corridor and going off through a doorway that's no longer a doorway, they don't know you're there. They are a recording that's been recorded into the building. And sometimes when conditions is right, they replay. You know, this is what the stone tape theory is. The thing as well with EMFs, right? EMF trackers are used by Sparkies to track cables and walls and yada yada yada. Ghost hunters use them to track electromagnetic fields. That's what they measure is electromagnetic fields. If you're in the woodies in the middle of NAY in a building that has no electricity, there should not be any electromagnetic fields. But when the body is exposed, I the human body is exposed to high levels of an electromagnetic field, you get the spins, you get a sicky feeling, you get like a clawing, pulling feeling in your stomach, and you feel like somebody's like right over your shoulder. If you've ever been in an MRI scanner, you know those feelings very well because it always feels like there's somebody in there, even though there's no actual room for someone to be in there with you. When the human body experiences an electromagnetic field, it reacts rather strangely. And what you've described and how you felt is a reaction to a high EMF level. Now, short of standing under a pylon or in a fuse box, you shouldn't have that feeling. So somebody maybe was looking over your shoulder. <laughs> Oak Bank House. Oak Bank House. I can't think of that one. So I've got Joseph Merrick. Burkhead. Oh, I, I can see the sign in my head, but I can't see where it is. Yeah. It also depends where you are in Bishop Mill because there's a, you know that road that goes along behind the Buccaneer where there's the 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 the, the Bonnie Errol and the hairdressers and the sweetie shop that road that goes along from there that's behind the main road. That whole street, both sides of the street, is on top of a massive, massive quartz deposit. So that can magnify. Ooh, Jocelyn's messaged on the White Witch page saying she missed most of this because hubby phoned, but she thinks that big stone that I showed is in the woods just to the south of Ragul, where she grew up. They used to go and dance on top of it as kids. Ooh. Cheers for that, Jocelyn. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's why I can see the sign not see the house because the sign's actually on one of the trees on that corner, isn't it? Aye. That'll be what it is. It 
it's uh i know it's a scheduled monument because that that whole little grassy wooded bit beside beach bray is actually a scheduled monument that wee grassy bit with the trees at the bottom of beach bray it's actually a scheduled monument a scheduled protected area not that there's a monument there like but oh caroline street's that way beach bray's that way caroline street's behind me and beach bray's up there But yeah, you've got the spiny stores, the shortcut up onto the top street. Then you've got the way the bus used to go up onto spiny street. Then you've got the old Andrew Thompson house. The Manny who used to have the gardening shop before it was a shoe shop on the high street, the foot garden. And then you've got the beginnings of Beach Bray coming up. But instead of going up Beach Bray, if you cross the bottom of Beach Bray onto that next patch of, patch of grass there, it's a scheduled protected area, is that patch of grass and the trees on that corner. Hmm. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. My pal used to buy them on Morriston Road and he had a wife who used to go into his meter cupboard. But what's on the other side of his meter cupboard was actually an old doorway into the bedroom. <laughs> it was a wee owl wifey as well. He was on Morriston Road, so it seems to have been a similar layout throughout all of those, that kind of houses. So, oh, well, I will leave you to it. Have a good night, whatever you're up to. And tomorrow is random chat and bre blether and I'll probably pull some angel cards or something again as well. So, be good. Stick to the rules. And look after you and yours. Good night, everybody.